traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. That's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. It's the Wilk Report. I'm Michael Wilk coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio with a review of Jordan Peele's The Twilight Zone, Season 1, Episode 9, entitled The Blue Scorpion. And this actually is one that uh, it, it, it tries to be its own episode, and it, 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 it's, it actually tries to be an episode of The Twilight Zone, but for some reason it just kind of fails. Uh, and I can't put my finger on why it fails because it, it it's not uh, it's clearly not pushing an obvious political agenda uh, down our throats or telling it in a, in a ham-handed way. Except at the end of the the episode with the the narration where it just kind of shoehorns something in. Uh, but otherwise, it, it seems very much like a just a regular TV episode drama, and maybe that's why it doesn't. Feel off, so yeah, I'm gonna yeah. There's a little sum uh, summary of a plot there, but uh, yeah, you can go ahead and take a look at that. So let's go ahead and yeah, we'll get to the uh, yeah, because you see Jordan Peele is uh, describing uh, the story. It's a guy named Jeff Stork, who's played by uh, Irish actor Chris O'Dowd. Uh, he's an anthropology professor whose wife is divorcing him. Uh, he's trying to go ahead and uh, get counseling. She refuses. Um, and then, uh, you know, while he's on the phone trying to reconcile with her, you know, failing miserably, uh, he comes back to his father's uh, trailer home uh, to find him dead from an apparent suicide. Uh, he seems to have shot himself. Uh, he finds a gun called the blue scorpion and it's just a really stylized uh chrome plated gun with a, uh, a pearl handle with a blue scorpion uh, emblazoned on it so uh you know that's where it gets its name uh and, and there's this little scene in the beginning of the episode after he finds his father's uh you know after he finds his father's uh gun where his father's name was on the bullet shell, uh, the shell of the the the, bu the bullet casing uh, that killed him. And when Jeff inherits the gun, he finds a bullet with his name on it. And after that, he starts encountering, you know, other people named Jeff. Uh, uh you know, someone he he tries to sell the gun to on. Uh, uh, to get rid of it uh, is named Jeff. Uh, his wife's lawyer is named Jeff. Uh, he finds out that his wife is actually dating a guy named Jeff, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, you know, so he, you know, so basically the, 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 the thing being telegraphed is that this gun is going to kill someone named Jeff, whether it's our protagonist or, or one of the other Jeffs, we don't know quite yet until the end. And it turns out, uh, it's, some guy who's been uh, breaking into people's homes and because uh, because uh, Jeff uh, after his wife tries to uh, take his father's favorite electric guitar he uh, you know he storms out of the uh, the meeting with her and her lawyer uh, you know claiming that uh, I love him far more than I ever loved you and it's kind of ambiguous as to whether he's talking about his father or the gun, because the gun apparently uh, is tied, because of the, the suicide note uh, that his father apparently left for Jeff says, I love him more than you. So it's implied that the gun has some kind of uh, anthropomorph uh, anthropomorphic uh, character. It, it, basically, it's... Uh, uh, you know, kind of this mashup of anthropomorphism and ammonism uh, that, uh, you know, it's basically that the gun is basically given its own uh, personality. Uh, it doesn't like being in the dark. 
uh, Jeff hallucinates one of the previous owners who died uh, after receiving the weapon who tells him the gun doesn't like to be left in the dark so he you know he puts flashlights <laughs> uh, in the desk drawer that he uh, keeps a gun in and in the bag that he carries it in uh, just so it doesn't have to be alone in the, in the dark and of course uh, you know finally uh, like I said you know at the end he ends up killing some guy named Jeff who uh, has been breaking and entering into different people's homes and uh, but he was actually sitting outside his wife's home in his car uh, preparing to go in and and murder the other Jeff whom his wife is dating but uh, you know that's when the burglar uh, suddenly uh, breaks the window of his uh, the, the the driver's side window and tries to uh, uh, struggle with uh, Professor Jeff and the gun which is on the on the dashboard goes off and kills the burglar and he's lauded as a hero and finally you know his life gets back together as you know he gets a promotion at work his wife agrees to uh, stop making all these demands of him and you know so finally he throws uh, the gun into this lake and it's found by a pair of kids, uh, one of whom is named Kyle, and the uh, bullet uh, has the name Kyle appear on it, but only Kyle can see it, uh, and Jeff, and only Jeff could see the bullet that had his name on it. He can, he was the only one who could see his name on the bullet. So, um, and, and then of course the uh, Jordan Peele's narration uh, goes ahead and gives us closing statement where it's like, uh, you know, it seems to imply the the episode was actually about uh, the danger of guns and uh, clinging to them and, and it's like it, it's it, it feels shoehorned you know like you're, you're not really it's like they, they felt that they had to push some kind of message in there in a story that you know otherwise was you know kind of self-contained actually a nice little drama uh, you know it's not a bad episode it's not great but it's not bad and so, uh, you know, it, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, because unlike Alex Klutzman and, and Jar Jar Abrams with STD, uh, you know, it's obvious that Jordan Peele really does like The Twilight Zone. He's a huge fan, and he's trying to, I guess, do what the Orville is doing with Star Trek, which is to take stories that have been done before and do them better, but they fail on so many levels because he's not having science fiction and fantasy writers do any of this. But, uh, but... Uh, this episode was written by Glenn Morgan, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and try and look him up here because, uh, yeah, he's an American uh, producer, writer, and director, born in 1947, uh, so, so let's go ahead and call up his IMDb page. And, okay, so he's been a producer on The X-Files, Space Above and Beyond, The One, uh, which was his action movie with Jet Li, Willard, uh, starring Crispin Glover. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, he's actually got uh, producer credits. And, and, you know, like I said, you know, he's been a bionic woman, actually. So he's, yeah, this is someone who's actually gone ahead and Right, and he's also been a producer. He's produced all ten episodes. So yeah, and then of course he's. Uh, let's see, Glenn Morgan. So it shows who directed and then written by. So yeah, I mean he's actually done pretty good on this. Uh, you know, because he's got writing credits on the Blue Scorpion, and maybe that's why it feels like it's actually a better. Uh, story than we've seen so far uh, on this re on this third revival that we've had because uh, as you know there was a revival in the 1980s after the Twilight Zone movie and then there was one in uh, 2002 that you know kind of it was kind of crap because it, it really just see kind of shallow and devoid of uh, any substance whereas in any direction whereas the 80s iteration it, it at least had science fiction writers and uh, fantasy writers and uh, and of course the next episode is a uh, the blurry man uh, which is kind of like this meta episode which uh, you know supposedly very horrific and also uh, has a surprise ending uh, which I've not seen yet 
uh, and I I'm going to watch it uh, probably sometime this week and try and do a review. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, it, the, the episode's not bad, it's not great, but it's not bad either. A and it's probably the, the one episode, though, that actually, you know, other than... Uh, you know, other than Six Degrees of Freedom, that actually feels like an episode of The Twilight Zone. And this is what kills me because, you know, and again, because, uh, you know, the problem is Jordan Peele is not really writing any of these. And he's and Jordan Peele is actually a, a great storyteller. You know, he directed Get Out, he directed Us, and these are, you know, two very good films. Uh, you know, you know, great horror films. But Rod Serling was... Uh, the driving creative force behind the original Twilight Zone. He he wrote uh, something like ninety two out of uh, one hundred and fifty some odd episodes. So, you know, he he was a primary driver. He wrote most of them. Uh, but with uh, Jordan Peele, you know, it, it it seems like he's just acting in it and not really contributing much other than that. So, uh, you know, it, it just feels to me like this is something that, you know, he needs to be do he needs to be getting his butt into the writer's room and churning out scripts, uh, and, and getting actual science fiction writers in there, you know, and cause Glenn Morgan, like I said, you know, he's, uh, he's actually got credits, uh, on shows like the X-Files and, uh, Space Above and Beyond and, uh, Willard, which was, uh, this really trippy, uh, really trippy uh, film with uh, Crispin Glover which shows a uh, so it, it's not like he doesn't have the directing and producing and writing chops for this he does and that's the problem is that you know he's the exception and not the rule and it's really sad because you know you, you can tell in fact you can see the title card the Red Devil uh, from uh classic Twilight Zone episode on the on the uh, on the little fortune telling thing in the diner uh, they've recreated that here as some kind of little glass bauble uh, so it, it's not like there isn't love and reverence for the Twilight Zone uh, you know as opposed to STD and uh, you know the Abrams Trek where they have nothing but contempt for the source material there's actually a lot of reverence here on the Twilight Zone but it's not enough. You need to have a, a lot more contributing uh, writing from Jordan Peele. You need to have uh, you know, a good stable of science fiction writers, fantasy writers, horror writers who, who know their craft, who, who, who have a reputation for telling good stories. And if you're going to uh, push political messaging in here, you know, I've got no problem with that, unlike a lot of uh, my fellow YouTubers. Uh, you know, I, I could name a few like Doomcock and Gary from Neurotic and uh, people at Midnight's Edge who have complained about uh, inserting politics, you know, in particular left-wing politics into episodes of their uh, rebooted TV shows and uh, and having it in movies like Star Wars and Star Trek and stuff. They complain about that, but here's the thing. It's like Rod Serling was a leftist. He, he was, you know, very liberal in his political beliefs, anti-authoritarian, uh, you know, most of the Twilight Zone was, you know, very much political, but the difference is Rod Serling never talked down to you, he never clubbed you over the head with his political messaging, even though sometimes it might have felt that way, but, you know, you know, if you were the target of his criticism, uh, but, you know, he also had, you know, very harsh criticism of Fidel Castro, and, uh, you know, he had an episode with Peter Falk where he uh, basically, you know, tore into Castro and the Cuban Revolution, which uh, personally I disagree with. I think it was a mistake, but, you know, I'm not going to uh, begrudge Rod Serling his opinion. Uh, but, you know, but this is the kind of thing that Serling did. He, he loved to insert politics into it. The difference is, you know, in the current iteration, it feels too preachy. It feels... Like the audit, like they they don't trust the audience to actually have intelligence enough. 
to understand the message. So they, they, fe they feel like they have to dumb it down and make it as obvious as possible. And that, I think, is a mistake. Because you've got so much potential here, but it's wasted potential. And that's a real shame because, you know, if, if this is going to continue at CBS uh, behind a paywall, then, uh, you know, I think that really needs to change. First of all, you know, we've had episodes this season where, you know, I feel that it should have been released on network television to a wider audience instead of making people have to shell out money to see it. And, uh, you know, we're not getting any of that. But even if it were available to a wider audience, I, I think it would probably not resonate nearly as well. Because, again, you're, you're presenting the messaging in a way that talks down to people, that bashes them over the head and insists on its own greatness. And it's really not all that great. It's very mediocre writing. So, um, But anyway, that's my opinion. What do you think? Do you agree? Do you agree? disagree? I want to hear from you. If you like what you've heard and you want to hear more, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to receive notifications whenever we upload new content. And if you want to help support the channel, keep the lights on, help us bring you more content, head over to our Patreon or subscribe to our page. We can't do this without you. Until next time, this is Michael Wilk for The Wilk Report saying take care, good night, I'm out.